Hi, I'm Shonda Stegall, and I'm the mom behind the website and podcast and social media accounts called And Before You Go. It's a place where I document my son's high school journey in the biblical truth, life lessons, and adventures we share during our time together as it starts to draw to a close. I'm so happy to be joining you today for the Brave Moms Conference, and I'm honored to be a part of what Kristen is doing to encourage moms during this season and really at all times. But I thought I'd start by just sharing a little bit more about me. My husband Fabian and I have been married for 20 years and we have three jovial, entertaining, athletic, and most important, hungry teenage sons. Our oldest son is a sophomore in college and our middle son is a senior in high school. I'll talk about him a little bit more later. Then our youngest son, he's a freshman in high school. They keep us busy, laughing, and in the kitchen because, as I stated, they're always hungry. But before I became a mom, and before I was married, and before I knew what I wanted to do with my life, I was born as a middle child. I have two older siblings and two younger siblings. And if you've ever wondered what it's like to be a middle child, let me tell you, it's not glamorous. Your older siblings, they don't respect you. And your younger siblings, they don't respect you either because you're not the oldest. And since you're not the oldest, you're really not the boss. You rarely are the first to do anything. And you're rarely the last to do anything either. You hardly ever get anything new because you could just have what your older siblings had. And you don't keep to keep things very long because you could give it to your younger siblings. But the kicker is when you're the middle child, your parents are still parenting. They haven't quite given up on all those rules that they set, and they're eventually going to give them up for your younger siblings, but they haven't yet. No wonder that's a whole syndrome dedicated to middle children, because being in the middle is awkward. It's an awkward place to be. You know, every great story has a meaty middle, and we can tell we've reached the middle when we have that, oh no, now what feeling? Like the part in Cinderella when the clock strikes midnight and her chariot turns into a pumpkin, but she's just met the love of her life. Oh no, now what? Or in The Lion King when mean old Uncle Scar takes over Pride Rock and we see Simba run off into the forest. Oh no, now what? Or what about that point in The Little Mermaid when Ursula takes Ariel's voice and all we need is for the prince to kiss the girl. And he doesn't. Oh no, now what? Every great story has a meaty middle. We all have middle moments all the time. Perhaps you're like me and you're standing in the grocery store and you're not at the end of the line, but you're not next. And then you see the cashier walking to open another line. It's time to make a decision. Do I move? and become first in that line? Do I wait it out here? Do I move? Do I wait? What do I do? A middle moment. Or have you ever been watching Netflix and the end of the episode is coming and you say, I'm gonna turn it off, but you only have four seconds to make that decision. Do you turn it off or do you watch another episode? It's a middle moment. Or maybe you're like me, or maybe not. When I turned 40, I thought, Finally, I've made it. But you know what? My older siblings, they're 50 and they know even more than I know. And my younger siblings, they're 30 and they think they know everything. The middle, equal distant from extremes. Not the start, but not the end. Friends, I can't help but notice that we're in the middle right now. This pandemic, it didn't just start, but it's not over. We're past the shock of the beginning, and now we're in the middle where we've kind of gotten some routines in place. Maybe you're in the middle of a rut of the mundane and the repetitive nature of each day. Or maybe you've embraced this new normal and you really don't want to see any more change happen. One thing is for certain, we are all having a middle moment. In scripture, we see many of our Bible heroes in their middle moment. Consider in Genesis, the life of Joseph. He started out well, the favored son of his father, but in his middle moment, 
he was sold into slavery by his brothers and then wrongly accused and jailed for a crime that he did not commit. Oh no, now what? Or what about Ruth? She married a nice, out-of-town Israelite guy, but in her middle moment, she found herself a widow on the road with her mother-in-law, traveling to a land that she didn't know to have a life that seemingly had very little promise. Oh no, now what? Or what about in the life of Job, a prosperous man favored by God and living a very good life? But in his middle moment, everything he had was taken away as messenger after messenger brought news of tragedy after tragedy. Oh no, now what? And then I think about the three Hebrew boys who in their middle moment refused to bow down to an idol and they were bound and tossed alive into a furnace whose fire was seven times hotter than normal. Oh no, now what? What do all of these middle moments have in common? They're not the end. Pixar, the creative geniuses who brought us great titles such as Toy Story and Cars, Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, they have a story structure that goes like this. Once upon a time, there was a blank. And every day, blank. Then one day, blank, the middle moment. And because of that, blank. And then the end. Until finally, blank. No story, no situation, no pandemic stops at the middle. There will always be an until finally. And what you hold on to in the middle will impact how much peace you will experience in your middle moment. Now let's look at our Bible heroes again. In the middle moment, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers and falsely imprisoned. Until finally, he was redeemed in the eyes of leadership and given a position of authority that ultimately put him in a place to bless those same brothers. And he says these words in Genesis 50, 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is being done now, the saving of many lives. Or in Ruth, in her middle moment, we found her on a road to an unknown land and her mother-in-law says to her, listen, go back to your people. I don't know what lies ahead and this might not work out well for you. And Ruth says to her, where you go, I'll go. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And then one day, still in the middle, she meets Boaz. And then the until finally part, Ruth and Boaz are married and Ruth has a son. In Ruth 4, 17, it says, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David, King David. And then in Matthew, Ruth is named in the lineage of Jesus. Or what about Job? In his middle moment, remember he lost everything and he sat for most of the book in sackcloth and ashes mourning. Then he has a conversation with the Lord and he ends up saying, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And then his until finally moment in Job 42, 12, it says the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the former part. Or how about those Hebrew boys? In their middle moment in Daniel 3, 17, they took a stand for the Lord and they said, if you throw us into this burning furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we will not serve your God or worship the image of gold that you have set up. And after those boys were tossed into the fire, they have their until finally moment where they're brought out alive and their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. Sisters, in your middle moment, recognize it is what it is, the middle, not the end. If we're in the middle, we can know we're not alone. If we're in the middle, we can be certain the story is not over. And in the middle, we can be at peace. One way to have peace in the middle is to put your hope in the one who knows the end. In 2007, my middle son was starting kindergarten and if all went well, he was
to be a member of the graduating class of 2020. I remember in that moment thinking, wow, 2020, that's cool. I also remember thinking, oh man, that's a really long way away. My son, he really loves sports and he loved to run and he loved to play. So we signed him up for flag football. Little did we know that year we would meet friends who would become like family as our sons played together that year and then for the next six to eight years and even more. You know, over time our circle grew and we all stayed in touch even as life changes occurred. Because when you find good mom friends, you hold on to them, even through moves and school changes and crosstown rivalries, you wanna make sure you hold on to them. You name it, hold on to your good mom friends. So as the reality of this pandemic set in and all of those hopes and dreams that we had set for our senior sons begin to kind of, the reality begin to show us that maybe the picture perfect ending that we had planned for senior year wasn't actually gonna come to fruition. I thought I'd call my friends and see how they were doing. And you know how we felt collectively? Sad. Sad for the son who skipped all the school dances, but decided this year he was going to go to prom. Well, prom has been canceled. Sad for the son whose team finally made a successful playoff run, only for the championship tournament to be canceled. Sad for the son who's turning 18 and wanted to have a big gathering of all of his friends for one final hurrah before everyone went their separate ways. Well, gatherings of 10 or more are prohibited. Sadness seemed to be the collective emotion, and rightfully so. However, with the sadness, each mom expressed hope. Hope is confident trust in an expected outcome. So despite the situation, we can still hang on to hope. Hope that grandmothers will still see their first grandchild walk across the stage, even if it's delayed or virtually. Hope that the band student who played pomp and circumstance for every class before him, the class of 2017, 18, and 19, now it's his turn. He's gonna hear that song, even if it's from a soundtrack in the living room. Hope that the son will not lose that big smile he had when he got that acceptance letter from his dream school and that he's going to go there even if the first semester is distance learning. In that moment, I was so glad that the Lord had given me mom friends who knew how to walk the tightrope of sadness with their eyes fixed on hope. In our middle moments, we must hold on to hope. Let's look at Psalm 42. The writer says, as the deer pants for streams of water, my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? In the middle moments, we must meet with God. The psalmist said that his soul pants, yearns, and can only be quenched by time in the presence of the living God. I will confess, in the beginning of this pandemic, my schedule was all out of whack. I found myself chasing my day instead of going fully charged into my day and commanding my day. And one thing that I felt that I chased all day was time with the Lord. I would wake up in the morning and there would be urgent work needs that needed my attention. And I would say, okay, I'm going to meet with the Lord at lunch. But by lunchtime, remember those hungry teenagers? Yeah, they were in need, and I found myself saying, okay, I'll meet with the Lord tonight. Well, by night, I was exhausted and fell into the bed, still panting for the refreshing that only time in his presence would provide. In the midst of this madness, I opened my Bible in search of a psalm that I knew, but not this psalm. And I fell right into this place, and it was exactly where I needed, Psalm 42. You cannot have peace in the middle if you do not prioritize meeting with the Lord. Learn from my cautionary tale and protect your time in his presence. He will nourish you in the middle. Picking up at verse three, it says, tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? In our middle moments, we must 
silence the voices of dissension and distraction. When you're a parent of a senior, people ask you the same question repeatedly these days. So how do you feel about the cancellation of everything you've been waiting to experience for the last 13 years? They don't exactly say it like that, but that's kind of how my ears hear it. And exactly how am I supposed to answer that when I know I have an overwhelming bent towards sarcasm? And it wasn't just the question, it was all the news and all the content and all the opinions and all the advice and all of it was becoming overwhelming. So I took a break. I deleted all the apps from my phone. I logged off and you know what happened? Life kept going. People kept posting, but I got to enjoy the quiet of my own thoughts in the presence of the Lord. I was able to set a much better rhythm for my day and suddenly the feeling of not having enough time went away. It was peaceful. In our middle moments, we must silence the voices of distraction. Picking up at verse four, it says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of the Lord under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. This verse makes me think about Easter's gone by. When our boys were little, we would dress them in three-piece suits on Easter Sunday instead of the normal jeans and polo shirts that they wear to church. And when we would arrive at church, all the other little kids would be dressed in three-piece suits and beautiful dresses. It was such a festive occasion as we celebrated the resurrection of our Savior. Well, this year, there were no suits. There was no festive gathering. Instead, we sat informally on the sofa in our living room and watched the live stream. I thought about Hebrews 10, 25, where in one version it says, don't forsake the gathering of yourselves together as some people are in the habit of doing, but instead encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. As I began to kind of wallow in the whoa, whoa, whoa is me of this isn't the Easter I planned, about that same time my middle son came into the room wearing shorts, a t-shirt, and a bow tie. It was comical, but it was also a reminder that this day is still a celebration. It was so encouraging because he reminded me to celebrate. And I'm so glad that Kristen has given us this moment where we can speak truth to one another. No, we can't gather together in person. And thankfully, this pandemic didn't happen in 1985. No, it happened in 2020 in the age of Zoom and Duo and Google Hangout and FaceTime. When you can't lift yourself up, you can get with a friend and pour out your soul and tell her, I need help. I'm having a middle moment. And if you're floating high through your middle moments, be proactive and search out a friend that you can uplift. Remember, none of us are alone in the middle. We have each other. And when we have each other, in our middle moments, we must encourage one another. Now, let's read verse five together. It says, why my soul are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. See, in 2007, our heavenly father knew my son's high school journey would end this way. He knew that the picture perfect plans that we had would be destroyed would be disrupted. He knew this middle moment was on the way. He knew then, and he knows now, and he is the one that's filling us with hope, true hope. Hope that knows that he is still in control. Hope that knows that he heals heart wounds, big and small. Hope that knows that he is at work, even in this. Hope that knows these light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. In our middle moments, we must put our hope in God. Romans 12, 12 says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, and be constant in prayer. 
Middle moments are inevitable. None of us can escape them. Not Joseph, not Ruth, not Job, not the Hebrew boys, not even Jesus. In his middle moment, his friends fell asleep when he asked them to pray. In his middle moment, he felt the separation from the Father. In his middle moment, he asked, could there possibly be another way? But then he says in Luke twenty-two forty-two, not my will, but yours be done. Precious words for us to live by in our middle moments. Not my will, but yours be done. Sisters, in our middle moments, we must meet with God. We must silence the voices of dissension and distraction. We must encourage ourselves and encourage others with the knowledge of his everlasting presence. We must hold tight to hope and praise God because this is the middle and not the end. Galatians 6, 9 reminds us to not grow weary in the middle for at the proper time, we will have our until finally moment and we will reap a harvest if we do not give up.